Hey, yes, yes first he's a slow. Ooh. That's me. Oh. Wow. Yeah. These guys came prepared. Mm -hmm. I threw this right. together at like 3 a.m. last night. <laughs> <laughs> That's the direction of our moderator. Yeah. He said, you guys better be ready. <laughs> Well, if anything, it's nice to, I mean, I, I wasn't really being prepared, for, getting prepared for this panel, but I was concerned about education, and we were talking about education around 3 o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> That's good. Says my witness. Do we want to start on, uh, what time is it? Um, yeah, it's uh, 9.59. One minute. Yeah. We go live in one minute. Is there water? Is there any water up there? Hmm? In the lobby area. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't say that out loud. Well, we're like sixty percent water, right? Yeah. yeah. There you go. I feel a little bit lower than that right now. I feel a lot lower than that right now. <laughs> well, after last night. Yeah. I don't know. I can blame some of it on last night, but as I was, ex I'll, I'll say it again. I've been running back and forth from the cob, in you know, in here. Oh yeah, you already at work. Oh, I've been at work. Yeah. <laughs> I've been at work since. Uh, I'm proud of myself just for being awake. Yeah. I'm shocked I woke up at 7. Oh, that's right. My wife had the place call us. <laughs> Wake up call. What are you thinking? No. <laughs> it was brilliant, actually. It was very, very smart. <laughs> did anybody have anything to get? I'm sorry. Huh? Yeah. Did, did you all sleep here last night? No? You drove in? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, we have a double. Uh, yeah, so I just noticed something else. You guys are going to have to forgive Discord popping up every now and then because my wife is in the room helping to moderate the gel event. So. Should we close it? Huh? Can we close it? Sure. Discord. You'll keep getting you'll keep getting notifications. Discord is the name of the uh, chat program. One of them, yeah. yeah. It's the one that we kind of. Discord is a chat program where um, yeah you can talk in the background. So yeah. Yeah. Discord seems like a really. Discord is awesome. Discord is awesome. Yeah. And if you if you are a GGDA member, we do have a GGDA Discord. All right. And you know, it's a it's gonna be like another uh, um, social board that you know you can chat with other GGDA guys. We're we're looking to turn that into even like job postings or resumes uh, postings and stuff like that. So just an FYI. Is, are we recording? We are? Oh, we started. Haha! -ha, good morning. <laughs> I guess we should start off properly. All uh, right. I guess. Um, well, my name is Brian Miller. I am founder of my. Uh, my company is Zatmill LLC. Um, I guess I'll be moderating or just joining this panel more than uh, one thing or the other. Uh, my company focuses on educational gaming and educational game development. Uh, what I mean by that, uh, if I've got a few educational games. And, uh, but I also teach game development to kids ages 10 through 18. I've um, been teaching at a, um, a private high school called the New School in Atlanta. I've also been teaching at UGA during their summer camps for the past couple of years. So anyways, uh, and, uh, I'm working steadily to improve it and push it more. I'm working with um, uh, Discovery High School in Gwinnett County and, and, and other schools as well within um, Barrow and Walton County. So um, anyways, good morning, Joe. Uh, you shouldn't be here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yes, this is educational game design and development. I'm yeah, very. Hopefully, this is the one I want to be. In. All right. Yeah. I'm very, very happy that they named it that because there is a, in my, you know, there is a difference between design and development. As you know, if you got to hear Jesse Shell talk, um, he would highlight that. Anyways, that's me. Let's go on down the list. You guys introduce yourself. I'm Stephen Borden. Uh, this is my slide up here. I'm a programmer and a game designer at Cogent Education, uh, which is a little startup that came out of a uh, University of Georgia research project, and we mainly focus on high school biology. Uh, I'll, I'll let Doug introduce himself before I launch into okay. more, more than that. Cool. So I'm Doug Jacobson. I run a studio here for 20 years or something like that, which has done entertainment games at first, but Gradually, some, more and more of those were educational, and then we found our niche that we really actually feel good, much more better about doing it, which are games that teach people things. People come out of the game with skills that they didn't go into the game with because those skills were practiced in the game. And those are rarely kids in classrooms. They're sometimes kids. 
Uh, but the majority of them are adults. Um, and I'll go through some more, I have a few slides where you with him. So a uh, general question to everybody in here, uh, does anybody here, I know I know for one, for a fact we do have a game publisher. Has anybody else in here uh, published a game at all? You have? All right, what is it? Uh, it's a Japanese language learning game. It's a block breaking game, but the levels are shaped like Japanese letters. And as you break the blocks, you hear the sound of the letter. So through that repetition, you could learn your Japanese alphabet. That is awesome. Very good, very good. Then we also have the legendary Puzzles by Joe. Yes. <laughs> but I do have, I have a bunch of games that I've never sold that are closer to the educational. So there are definitely some things that lean towards uh, logic for sure, pure logic, not my relaxation, you know, cl clutter games. And I've always been interested in this group. And I even have a game that everybody's ever hated since 1993 when I first created it called Math Wheels, which I saw as a, it was a, it was a puzzle you picked up that was sort of magnets and stuff, but it had it had like maybe seven discs, so there was three numbers, two discs with symbols, the equals, and the final thing. And you're supposed to you're supposed to spin them all till you get equations that are correct on all the sides. And I loved that puzzle, so I created a thing called Math Wheels that did this in a five by seven or out of a grid, and as you clicked, it wrapped for you. And and it actually told you the current value versus the what you're trying to get, and and nobody's like to accept for me. I still. <laughs> it's like a combination of Rubik's cube and Sudoku. It's not. No, it's not Rubik's cubeish at all. Oh. It is. It is truly just. It's just too much math for for certain people. <laughs> and, it's, it's, and even again, even I do the math for them. Mm -hmm. So all they have to do is make sure that this fine. This total of what's currently happening actually equals their target value. And it's really, for people that are good in math, they can sit there and go, oh, the, the seven has to be there because there's no way with the time, you know, that seven has to be in that column. And so they lock that in and they deduce. And there's only a little bit of brute force possibly, but nobody wants to do math. I mean, how many people love Ken Ken over Sudoku? Me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyways, I've always been fascinated with education. When I retire someday, I may. I would love to figure out how to do a better math teaching game because you know they never put enough enough variation, enough interesting stuff, and they actually don't. They don't go beyond rote learning uh, enough. And I'd like, especially with the tools you got nowadays, you. Got to be able to figure out. Oh, math is that. math is definitely one of the very very important skills, you know, to practice and you know making math games to help our youth uh, further their you know math skills is is an excellent way. I mean, I, I firmly believe that you know game there is a way to learn and teach uh, via games. And so I, I know Stephen, I've seen some of your projects, and it looks like you've already got something pulled up here. Yeah. Why don't you talk about it and sure. tell us what you got going on? Yeah, uh, he's before, prepared. Before I start, if we have any more audience participation, is there a microphone <coughs> for the recording? No. Okay. Just curious. Camera, camera has the ambient mic. I'm assuming. Well, I know you got these up here. Okay. Cool. Okay. Joe's loud enough when he's talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know I've got a big mouth too. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like I said, um, we focus on high school biology. Uh, our main product line is. Uh, interactive case studies, which are more kind of serious games um, that present like a real world topic and then you have to kind of apply the, the scientific uh, process to them. Um, but we also have made some game, like explicit games, uh, which I have worked on a lot. Uh, nice use of Mandelbrot, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> I, I love that logo. That's great. Um, <laughs> these are the three games that we've released. Um, Ozzy Osmosis against the Gradient and Nurbits, uh, and they're all available for Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, iOS, and Android. Um, and kind of uh, our design philosophy, so I'm mostly going to talk about design, um, is that the mechanics of our game are, are what we're trying to teach. So our, our learning objectives are aligned with our mechanics. So the mechanics are the message. So um, hopefully this will work. I'm going to show you. Uh, an example of how Ozzy Osmosis works, because that's kind of our, our most simple game to, to grasp. 
um, and hopefully this video will load it. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to awkwardly explain it to you. Um, okay, so in this game, oh, it worked for a second. You're this little cell, and what you can control is you can move, and you can also uh, add or remove these yellow triangles, which are like solute, like salt, and then the blue squares uh, that you see kind of coming in and out, that's water. And so uh, how osmosis works is a cell has a semi-permeable membrane, and uh, based on the concentration of solute, uh, water will come in and out. So as you move through the environment in this game, you have to try to match the concentration of the environment around you. Otherwise, water will come in or out of your cell, and if you have too much water, you'll pop, you'll like get too full and explode. And uh, if you have too little water, you'll shrivel up and you'll die. So um, it's kind of an exploration game uh, where you're trying to stay alive. Um, and so you, this game is like kind of a stealth learning game where the game doesn't really, other than having like osmosis in the title of the game, it never really tells you what osmosis is. You just, as you're playing the game, the mechanics are how it, osmosis works. And, uh, you know, our, our idea was, uh, you know, a, the teacher would be kind of responsible for teaching you what osmosis is, and then this game could either be, either you play it first before you learn about osmosis, and then you would kind of have a epiphany, like, oh, that's what we were doing in the game, or you would have already learned osmosis, and this would be kind of a review kind of thing. Um, and then the, so the other two games that we made, uh, against the Gradient and Nurbits, those are both puzzle games that are a little, um, they're not stealth, they're more explicitly learning, and I'll, I'll talk about why that is for a second. Um, but, uh, so what, one thing that we're trying to do with these games is we, like, uh, the description of the talk said, you know, how do you balance fun and making an educational game, and it's, it's not easy. Uh, it really depends there's many different ways to do it, like the way I was describing where your mechanics are your learning objectives. That's one way to do it, and I'll talk about another way that I did later, but um, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. It really depends what your learning objectives are, who your target audience is, and, uh, you know, are you trying to sell the game? Are you trying to give it away for free? Like, those are, those are things to think about. Um, so, uh, the way our company was funded we got uh, SBIR grants from the NIH and the NSF, and what SBIR stands for is uh, Small Business Innovation Research. So the idea is you're, you're doing innovative research to prove that what you're doing helps education in our case, uh, but you're also forming a small business that will hopefully be profitable and can continue to do it after the government stops funding you, right? Uh, and so We've done research on these games, and in fact, uh, Nurbits was the longest project that we worked on of these. It was uh, we got two two grants, a phase one and a phase two. Each of those was two years of development. So we did a lot of in-school testing. Uh, we worked with an educational researcher at UGA. Um, so we did a lot of like pre-test, post-test uh, with control classes that don't play the game, and. Uh, a lot of intervention where our, our researchers are interviewing the, the students and the teachers and kind of figuring out what they like and they don't like. And so I'm going to show you some student quotes uh, about, so here's one about stealth learning. Uh, a student said, look, it's no surprise that we we're supposed to learn from the game. We aren't stupid. We are at school. This just makes it cool and it makes sense. We know that the, there's going to be learning attached to it. <laughs> uh, and actually, so, uh, so we tested in a bunch of different classes. and. It, and we also, like, so this is aimed at high school, but we also tested in middle school. Um, and a thing that was really surprising to me was AP students. We tested in an AP biology class. They got really frustrated when they didn't understand why they were doing this in school. Like, they weren't just like, oh, this is fun. I get to play a game today. They were like, how am I getting graded on this? Like, how is this going to affect my college application? That kind of stuff, which was really... I didn't expect that. It was, it was really interesting. Yeah, versus mastery goals. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's another one. So th I was talking about the stealth learning approach where we were hoping you know, the teacher would teach this. Uh, this is another stu uh, student quote. If a teacher says it, I probably won't listen. I'd rather have the game explain it. I know, it's go I know going in it's an educational game. So that was another interesting thing I, I didn't expect. 
Uh, they wanted, so they trusted the game more than the teacher for some reason. They, they already kind of have a bias against the teacher. Um, I don't know, maybe it was just that particular teacher, yeah. but <laughs> you never know. Um, where's my next slide? Okay. Uh, what else did I want to say about these games? So uh, against the Gradient and Nurbits are puzzle games. They are a little bit more explicitly geared towards schools. There's more text. Um, we tried to use it as sparingly as possible uh, because, as you know, gamers will skip a lot of text. Um, but again, we try to tie our mechanics as closely as possible to the learning objectives. So what you're doing in the game is what you're trying to learn. Um, another approach that I tried is uh, the, the CDC and HHS, HHS uh, Games for Health Game Jam in 2014 um, was uh, geared at HIV. So the CDC came in and they said, we want you to make games that teach about HIV. We want to uh, teach people their options for getting tested for HIV. We want to reduce stigma. Um, go make some games. And so what we made was uh, kind of an interactive narrative game. Um, does anybody know what Twine is? It's, yeah. uh, it's an interactive fiction uh, authoring tool that uh, lets you make um, hypertext-based interactive, interactive fiction. So there's two types of interactive fiction. There's parser-based, where you like type in whatever you want, and maybe it knows what you're talking about. And there's hypertext, which is like a web page where you have links that you click on. So we have like some story bits, and then you have some options to choose. Here, I'll, I'll play this video, and you can kind of see how it works. But we have uh, the twine bits that are, are the interactive fiction um, combined with some like WarioWare style mini games. And so as a student goes through, they find out from a former partner that their partner uh, is HIV positive. And so they, they get options like, do I want to go to a clinic? Like, how do I, how do I find about, out, out about how I get tested? Um, and uh, one interesting thing about this approach is it lets the player kind of find out about what they're interested in. If they're not interested in something, they can not choose it. Um, and we won the game jam, and the CDC did a study on our game, and uh, it, it found out, or the study found that the game was effective for teaching the things that they wanted it to teach, um, which was really cool. Uh, Unfortunately, they haven't released the study yet, and so we, we have also not released the game. So we, uh, we put the game on our website at one point, and the CDC was like, oh, wait, uh, don't, <laughs> don't do that, because we don't want to damage our study data. You know, we have a control group, and if they happen to run into this game on the Internet somehow, which I don't think is, is very likely, uh, mm -hmm. that might damage our data. So anyway, they were like, take it down, and we did. And so it's currently not available, but if... Uh, email me, I could send it to you. So um, you made this in Twine? We made, we authored the interactive fiction bits in Twine, and then we brought it into Unity, and okay. we made the mini games in Unity, and all right, all right, very good. it all in very Unity. Um, so anyway, that's another approach, it's like kind of a first person narrative that really kind of puts you in the story, and you can choose whatever dialogue and find out about whatever information you want. I mean, one, one downside to this is, uh, if you're for like the classroom setting, you don't know that every student is going to see all of the information, so that's kind of a trade-off. So, so for the CDC study, actually, they did a pretest, post-test, and I actually wrote kind of a logging function that would tell them for each study participant which information they saw, like uh, which scenes in the game aligned to their pretest, post-test questions. So, like, if they got the question wrong but they didn't actually see that scene in the game, they could kind of discount that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I have prepared for you guys. So I'm going to pass <laughs> well, it over uh, to Dev. To highlight, the, I mean, so interesting that you, um, you know, that you did. I, I was at the same game jam, by the way. We didn't win, obviously. <laughs> and um, uh, it's interesting, though, you know, that you used Twine to help build an interactive game. Where actually, in my classes, uh, I use Twine as the educational tool for them. And yeah, uh, we do. It's I, I. I like to describe Twine as uh, on a l more simpler grounds is it's an easy tool for kids to learn how to build a choose your own adventure game, right? Because the the power and the the imagination that these kids have are, are amazing. Um, I don't know if I have an example on this computer. I hope I do. But one of them uh, along the same line, uh, one of my students made a game called Snack Dating, 
all right? It's a snake dating game, all right? <laughs> all right? Um, and uh, yes, uh, it's, you can, you know, male can choose male, uh, female can choose female, or, you know, uh, or vice versa. A anyway, um, and they went off on their own and put, um, you know, they studied offline, uh, or, you know, I, I can't get my words straight, sorry. Um, you have to read into how each character is built and then choose whether where you go on a date and then uh, also you choose like if you give them a gift or what kind of gift you give them and it both of you know these uh, will give a value on whether or not uh, you know you can make the kiss or if you get friend zoned or do you friend zone the person you're dating right so anyway it's it was amazing piece of work yeah yeah it was an amazing piece of work uh love to show it off i'm very very proud of them hey i guess the whole thing is you know uh showing the using a game to teach uh you know coding yeah because it's html and all i did really uh i built a text-based soccer game and they came up with that on their own the uh, with the soccer game, you know, you have these simple if statements, um, you know, and therefore they're getting their hands dirty with some hard coding. Something evil about Twine, though, and why I love it so much, <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, Twine does not supply you with a uh, word correction or grammar correction, all right? So if you misspell something, it doesn't give you that little squiggly line. If you put misplace a comma or something like that, it doesn't give you the little squiggly line. And so I offer the kids, when they do build their story, to turn it into their English teacher, or, you know, professor. Some unintended uh, grammar and spelling learning. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> stealth so learning. The tool. It's, that yeah. is my. That is one of my methods for stealth learning uh, of uh, English writing and you know grammar correction. So, anyways, so just highlighting on that. Uh, oh. Is it important to learn to how to spell without a spell checker? Spelling is important, Bob. <laughs> What, what was your game in there? Huh? You were the egg protector? Uh, egg, egg, defender. egg defender. Egg defender. Now, egg defender um, is also uh, it's an STD, STI, an unplanned pregnancy awareness game. Yes, that is a mouthful, but I finally learned how to say it. <laughs> uh, that one was created in 2013's Game Jam, Georgia Game Jam. The CDC also hosted um, a list of, th of topics to choose from, and we were the only team that actually chose um, S, you know, the STD and unprotected sex. So, like, we, we went into two categories that year. We were finalists for that year, uh, but that was also the year the government had their shutdown. So, we, uh, you know, here at Siege, we lost our CDC judges. So, we didn't win. But uh, the very next year, uh, early 2014, CDC announced an online submission for, uh, and we were declared winners on that one. So, <clears throat> I'm ashamed I can't remember. Uh, a little bit of the game. Was it in vain? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that sounds right because it was Galaga in a vein, I think. So, I, okay. So it was may have been. Vain is what it was. I, I you think it may have been more that you remember. Because it was an awesome game. It was fun. It was, they did a good job. All right. Uh. <laughs> okay, I just brought some notes, but these are not like, like what I do. These are like general thoughts. What games. Ah, so this. So I was invited, and I'm really honored to be on stage with you guys, um, but no one ever asked me, like, if I wanted to be in a, something called educational games that was about fun, and how fun and learning work together. Because I don't think I would have called it educational games, and I don't think I would have said that fun is the most important thing. So I want to be grumpy about those two <laughs> topics. Uh, in particular, educational games makes me feel like it's a long time ago because it's hard to sell something with that as an education. Everything I think of is just how can I sell it? It might be a great name. Um, so, so a long time ago, the, probably be, you guys weren't even born, there was like Oregon Trail, uh, and Reader Rabbit. I was just getting ready to ask, what was the first educational right. game out there? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> well, okay. He gave it away. So, yeah, so these educational games were, were successful. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail, Ma Math Blaster, maybe? I believe Oregon Trail holds the record for being the first educational game. I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to put it I'd say so. Monopoly was the first educational <laughs> game. No shit, it was Oak a good, That's a good Yeah, one. it was yeah. built to... Yeah. It's was subjective, I think. Monopoly's closer. Yeah, okay. Monopoly was With built teach to... Te teach economics. It, it, it teach. visibly under that. Yes, it taught people to become exactly what the capitalists, right. and it was a <laughs> socialist game. <laughs> <laughs> it failed. It taught, yeah. 
like, well, it's a yeah. failed parody. The games that just everybody throws away the rules and says, screw it, I don't want to play the way they... Well, they took the wrong lesson out of it. Why? They said the mean guys are winning, and instead of going out in the street and having a revolution, they wanted to be a mean guy. And oh, it's fun to be mean and win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many people put money in the, uh, in the center and grab it for free parking? Oh. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Nobody plays Monopoly according to the rules because yeah. the rules really suck. Well, well then, yeah, yeah. they need to auction everything. Exactly. It's, it's just exhausting. insane. Nobody, it, the, the Monopoly that's played is not the Monopoly. People have a lot more time. Oh, when this is the, if you have to use parking, then your game lasts three times as long because the money doesn't actually get out of the system. Right, right. That's one yeah. of the There's no radio. There's no TV. There's no internet. A game that lasted three hours. He just made a very valid point here. That when Monopoly was out, right, we didn't have like uh, the internet. Correct. Right. Or, or you know, and it was more common to spend a three-hour session with your family. Right. You know, um, but whereas now, you know, our attention span is not <laughs> stuck with your family. Rules <laughs> by rule, word of mouth somehow. There was no place that said. Free parking, money. you know, how did that spread? Yeah. That's a very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's a kind of cultural phenomenon that's mm. all around Monopoly. Yep. And, and just a note about like technology and stuff. I used to play a Monopoly computer game when I was a kid, and I would let it play with the regular rules because it would do the auctions for you. It made it so much easier. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a lot quicker too. So I, at about that time, the people who bought those games were parents. You know, they knew, none of those were a few little schools had it, but so the parents were always in this position. I want to buy a game that's good for the kid, but I want him to play it. So we would sell these as edutainment because it's entertainment for the kid and education for you. But of course, that doesn't distinguish it from a lot of other edutainment products like a, like a cartoon. That, teaches math or a, a song that teaches the days of the week. Um, and and then things changed too in uh, like around the beginning of this century where uh, what? Probably going to use arrows. There you go. Yeah. Okay, I always have my numb on. Huh? <laughs> um, when the people paying for the games were not uh, Parents, but institutions, not schools yet, and, and still not schools yet. Now, twenty years later, but um, military, no, number one, they believe they obviously believe in the value of games since since chess or Go or, or you know a lot of those evolved that and all the war games. Those weren't they weren't screwing around. You got to learn to fight someplace where you're not going to die. Uh, so, so they when digital games came out, they were the among the first to accept them as a way to learn. And the fun part of it was dangerous to someone trying to sell into the, those kind of institutions. So they decided, and, and the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, took a couple million dollars and said, we're going to look at how interesting games are and how people study when they're playing a game. Maybe they should study something other than the rules of Parcheesi or whatever. whatever it is. Uh, let's, let's create uh, this um, a, a, a set of conferences around what was named, so they named it Serious Games, and had the Serious Game Conference. And that name, well, you've even used it now, it still <laughs> sticks, but it's so wrong. You know, it's it's such a reaction to the to the, to the the badness of the fun, which is bad yeah. in part. Uh, but I mean, every game we make that teaches is funny. So it's not a serious game. And there, I've never played Final Fantasy, but I think it's pretty serious. You know, um, have why you pitched hum humorous games to the military? <laughs> 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 I've sold humorous games to the military. Yeah. I was sometimes. I just meant the terminology. Oh, no, yeah, not the term. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the game isn't serious. The purpose of the game is serious. Yeah, but it's a dead name. It's a dead <laughs> name. So, do you have a better one? Yeah, I'm going to go through the rest of them. Don't you see how, how, how this is at the top of the yeah, obvious uh, list of things I've gone through yet? I think of you as serious. I tell people. I use I it because it's a true word. People know <laughs> that, that name. Yeah, yeah, it's stuck for some reason. It's stuck. Yeah, uh, well, okay. And at the same time, because the, the military kind of minded people, people who selling to the military and, and other big organizations had the serious games, the people who were like NGO oriented and, and do gooder type 
the, you know, sort of saw themselves opposed to that mindset, didn't share that name. They used Games for Change because also they're trying to teach a little more than, uh, um, you know, like a curriculum-based thing. They're trying to teach an attitude, right? So they're, uh, and in fact, we really want, who went with this is uh, is Ian Bogost. People know Ian. Oh, yeah. Georgia Tech. Okay. Right, so yeah. he, he tried to introduce this term persuasive games, which, oh, and by the way, when you name it, you keep that name, too. Like, uh, the woman who invented the name Games to Change, well, that's the name of her conference, and if that name gets taken up by everybody, then her company is, is, owns a very really important yeah. brand. Same thing with, with Ian. If people took up persuasive games, well, that's the name of his studio. Uh, so that would be valuable to him. But I think he did it because he believes it. But, you know, when you look at persuasive games, it's not, I'm going to persuade you about that pi r squared. I, I might be persuading you to buy, uh, you know, a certain Dairy Queen ice cream. That seems more, I think he meant it from a, he started in political games, and I think he meant put persuasive that way, but it's certainly more oriented towards... Mm, uh, yeah, of course, gamification too. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> apply games. Okay, this is one I made up. Nobody picked it up. <laughs> but yeah, this was again. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought these are games that serve an ulterior motive, so they're applied. Yeah. It would be a good name for a company too. I didn't. Try. No, I, I actually kind of like. It. I mean, because uh, uh, the games yeah. that I the games that I've made, I'm literally using those games uh, in an applied method to teach. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and it's not, I mean, a text-based soccer game. I'm applying that game to teach them how to work and use Twine. Um, my, uh, um, oh gosh, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, of course, we say games, like serious games, are and maybe applied games, and th that they're all to teach, but they're also for other things like research. Like some, there are games that are built just to get psychology, psychological information or, or marketing information. So the game has a serious purpose, but it's not necessarily to change the player. But this is what Jesse Shaw uses for his company, mm. Transformational Games, which is kind of august, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, you don't think? No, I mean, uh, what do you mean? You're transforming. What do you mean by august? Is it um, a gust can be good or bad. If you can pull it off, it's good. Right. <laughs> he can pull it off. I don't yeah, think I, I can pull it off. Yeah. Um, I don't think every game I want to make is going to promise to transform someone. Yeah. It, it you know? Is, yeah, it is a, what do you call it, a grandiose. Nor do I think that every game he makes transforms right. the person. Of course not. Yeah. But they, they're great games. So Transformations expecting not. You should only go through a couple of transformations in your whole life. Um, but the whole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, we're all transformed a little bit when we play Tetris. Um, but all these still have the same problem. They all say this game is going to change the player, right? I'm going to transform them, I'm going to persuade them, I'm going to. You know, whatever. Um, they're all about the game. But uh, modern educators don't like the word education. They don't like the word teaching. They don't. Uh, about, especially about with learning. The, that's it. Okay. Oh, right. Right. Learning is what you do. Teaching is a tool to make you learn. It may work, it may not. But if you're learning, game over, that's good enough, right? It's about you, the, okay. you, the student. So uh, I, uh, on that note, I'm going to show you, or I guess read out loud, because obviously camera can't see it, but my tagline for my company, Unbound Learning Through Lifelong Experience. That's it. It's not Unbound Teaching. It's Unbound, because who the hell would want that? Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, they want Unbound Learning. Everyone's lecturing to you always. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, like, I sometimes say learning games, but learning games is really hard to say, because it sounds like I'm going to learn new games. Right? I mean, it just doesn't, it's hard to say. It's hard to read. So this is the one I see a little bit now. I use all the time game-based learning. You know, it's learning and it's using yep. games as a tool. Um, gamification is something else. Gamification is... The and evil. Evil. Huh? <laughs> it's evil. <laughs> <laughs> gamification. It's evil. 
I don't know, I mean, again, yeah. you know, from the market point of view, gamification, a game, a game-based, a game that, op, a, a game that you really learn from costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to make to get one topic right, and that's cheap. If you get off that cheap, yeah, you're it really is. I mean, if you think and about employing a small team for a few years to make a game, right, and it's, and it's the, expensive. Yeah, it's really expensive, and to get it right, that's the minimum. That's cheap. Uh, if, unless your subject is where you can buy it off the shelf. But if you're a company and you want to train somebody to something, you're looking at that kind of cost, the, you know, a chunk of a million. Um, but a guy is going to come by and tell you you can gamify your problem for $20,000, and you can. You can totally gamify it for next. You can do it yourself, or you can pay somebody a five figures to, to, you know, to gamify it. And gamification means forget about the, the actual mechanism. I love this, uh, the it's mechanisms and the message. Itself, That's beautiful. The badges, the it's <laughs> the only the reward, yeah. the reward yeah. system. Yeah. It's, it's Which, basically... Which, context, may or may not work the same way they do in an actual game. Right. Well, it's it's adding it works. game like mechanics Correct. as as cheap psychological yeah. tricks to Correct. motivate you. Yes. Adding points, adding achievements, badges, whatever. Yeah. Which is first of all, it's exhaustible, right? I mean, yeah. it's just so long you're going to buy into that. It, it's, but also, it's a good way to tell you to do something. I could gamify digging a ditch or cleaning your room or or um, buying going to McDonald's, um, and they do. All those things are, are gamified. It, it is a good way to compel somebody to do something that something might be learning, but there's no guarantee it is. It's just doing something. Um, but you're saying, you know, it's got the same word in your game, and it looks very, very similar to someone who hasn't taken the trouble to see that it doesn't have a mechanism yeah, and correct. doesn't have a message, correct. except do this. You right, know? exactly. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, won't So even before gamification, we use stars for my son when we potty trained him. Sure. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's great. But but when businesses use it as just a way as a marketing tool to try to increase all they care about is increasing engagement with nothing really being engaged. It's just what the well, yeah. So the reason your son cares about it is because he cares about you, Correct. and, and right. it's you approving of him, right? Yeah. Correct. Correct. He wants and to stars do represent that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But when it's a corporation that's telling you to buy more things, it's uh, it's yeah. a different thing. You have to and it's do it the way just shiny badges. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the next slide is actually, if I can jump to it, uh, yes, is about this. Yes. It's, yeah, it's, it's different ways to teach. And and because uh, one of the things that started this like serious game movement was a book called Learning by Doing. But Learning by Doing is not... Well, we'll get to it. So I, this is based on that kind of phraseology, which is right now, well, this is kind of interactive, but most presentations like this are a lecture, and you learn by listening. And, and it works great. It's really cheap. It's not scalable. Well, it's scalable. The, the Khan Academy does that, right? It's just a lecture that's done by someone who really does it well, and you listen to that. That's okay. It works for certain kinds of things. Uh, and instructional video, you know, you can also watch, which I guess that's a Khan Academy, because they have they draw things on the whiteboard. Um, and, uh, but what they're doing is simulation. Simulation looks like a game, it feels like a game. I think when you said the series game part of it was probably heavy on the simulation. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, a, a little bit. The, well, what, what my company does? Or? So when you said that you had three fun games, and the one that was a serious game. Yeah, they're serious in that they use kind of game technologies, 3D models, animations. Uh, There's a little bit of interactivity. But it's it's a lot more like a standard kind of curriculum, uh, mm -hmm. where you're you're just you're reading a lot of stuff, um, and you kind of have some quizzes in there. Um, it's it's based more on, on like applying the scientific method, which is good. Um, but it it seem it's a lot more like the standard curriculum, but in a interactive form, uh, on a computer, basically. So that's cool. So that's much more complex than that. I <laughs> Like when we started with the military, we often had a call, it's not, not a game, we had a call. We could call the game maybe to the guy who was, we're pitching to, but the guy who he, who had to get approved, would have to write it up as a simulation. Uh, and it, the simulation's a little different, you know, the, um, it doesn't, well, um, 
We call it simulation, and then we call it a game to our people in our studio, even when it really still was just a simulation. So it kind of depends on what you want to see. But gamification, you learn because you win. Whatever it is, uh, you know, you just keep winning and winning. Maybe you win slow, maybe you win fast, but that's the way you win. That's the way you learn. But that's different than game. A game you learn when you lose, typically. You know, if you, if you win some uh, challenge in the game, it's because you already knew the answer, which means you didn't learn it, you didn't have to learn it. That's good, too. Uh, not wasting time learning things you, don't, you already know. But the real learning is happening when you make the mistake. Yes? I'm just curious, because I'm, I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I know a lot about the kind of the millennial generation and a lot of the research on uh, mastery versus achievement orientation mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Do you ha get any resistance and blowback from people because, like, losing, they're, they're supposed to learn by losing, and, and they're taught you can't make a mistake. You're not supposed to make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you're stupid. Right. It's, and, and, can, we, uh, well, can I can I pipe in on that a Anybody. second? So all right, so uh, with Egg Defender, you're going to lose. Yeah. All right, and that and that's part of the purpose of the game. You know, it's a survival game. You know, how long, how many levels can you survive? But eventually, you're going to lose because it just keeps getting harder. You know, procedurally, procedurally gets harder and harder. Uh, in the end, um, I mean, the game, um, you can defend off all the STDs for, that are attacking an embryonic cell. All right. Um, but there's, and you can, uh, you can have a complete health bar. But no matter what, if a sperm cell gets past your defenses, and within 10 seconds it'll you know, penetrate the the egg, right? Game over. Doesn't matter how much health you have. Doesn't how much matter how much currency you have. And you know, and that's the message of the game. You know, protective sex and you know unprotected sex can be you know result in childbirth. So yeah, I'm going to back that up and say you know learn by losing. That's the purpose of of egg defender. So. Well, so if I can respond to that for a second, the, the problem with our education system right now is, yes. is it doesn't teach critical thinking. Exactly. And that's exactly why. People don't want to get frustrated. They don't want to be challenged. Uh, they don't want to think. You, know? <laughs> you, have to, you have to have proper ramping regardless. Yeah. And if you ramp well, then they get yeah. these little mini ahas as they learn by losing. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not losing by beating your head against the wall. Right. You don't want to have them slam against the a brick wall where they don't know what to do. Right. You want them to be able to figure it out so by an, thinking about it. Another mechanic inside of Egg Defender is uh, once you complete a level, you get hit with a, uh, a quiz question, right, straight off the CDC. And you're rewarded if you answer that correctly uh, with currency to be able to buy more special weapons, et cetera, or power-ups. Um, but if you get it wrong, of course, you don't get any kind of reward and the next level is going to be even harder. Again, you're about to lose. Um, and there's also an option within the game to where you can actually practice all these questions. Uh, regard, uh, one of my favorite ones uh, that is surprisingly how many people get wrong, which you're obviously going to know what the answer is now, <laughs> is uh, can a girl get pregnant before her first period? But, right? Yeah. And what's the answer? Of course. Yes. Right. But when you actually show this question, you know, if I hadn't prequeled that at all, if I'd just shown you the text, would you have still answered yes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? I do, I mean. uh, yeah, I mean, um, the so odds are really low, by the way. The odds are extremely low, right. But possible. I mean, uh, statistically girls do better in egg defender than boys do. It's amazing, right? But <laughs> boys do really well with um, the actual gameplay, you know, shooting. Uh, factor, but when it comes to the qu questions, <laughs> where you know that's where the girls really uh, shine. So anyway, I actually <coughs> been selling learning by losing so long that I actually have a counter slide to it. Yeah. Yeah. This is my counter slide. Yeah, I, I I wasn't like arguing against it. I think that's great. I was just wondering about the reactions of the students. Like, if the students don't like it, if they're oh. resistant to it. Wait, they understand in the game they're not going to win right away. <laughs> they, they, well, listen, a Which game, in, in school, if you get 100 on all your tests, the teacher did a great job. Mm -hmm. In the game, if you win everything, it, the game designer did a really, really bad job. Yeah. And the users know both those things. So that's a good, good argument for yeah. using games. You, you, can, yeah. you can also bypass. So I'm in the casual market, mm -hmm. right? And I finally evolved to the point where I don't want to give handcuffs to my customers on any level. 
So now I've evolved to the point that, because some play it without timer for totally relaxation or whatever, but all my levels are timed. Now when you lose the level, it immediately comes up and says, would you like to finish the level? Because actually part of my audience is sort of OCD complete people that don't <laughs> want to have finish a level. Do you want to replay it to get the win? Or do you want to just move on because you didn't like this puzzle? And I got great feedback from putting that in. That's the one feature I put in this last game that that hit it out of the park. So entertainment factor, yeah. Right. And, but it's a casual market. It's it, the people that love Candy Crush or whatever. And I'm not going after the whales that want to pay to win and that kind of stuff. But giving them the option t to them, which to me is respect for the player, they yes. get to make the choice. They can go replay, replay, replay if they really feel the need to beat that level. But they can also go, you know what, I just want to complete it. Yes. And and that's copping out, sort of. I mean, it, I, I felt it was a cop-out for me to do it, but I finally convinced myself it was the right answer and for my game. Right. And yeah. the feedback I got seemed to be a right answer. Nobody nobody complained about that. It's really a hard, uh, hard problem in games, and that that's one way yeah. that works for your game. Uh, yeah. In education, even outside of games, the ideal situation is if a student is struggling, the teacher should help them. That's what the right. teacher yes. is there for. Right. Yes. Um. <clears throat> sorry, I'll shut up, but I just wanted to say one more thing about that was that like supporting of autonomy needs uh, does appear to be like a very good thing with games, and especially if you're you were talking about high schoolers, like there's research showing they do not feel like they get enough autonomy that's developmentally appropriate for right. their age. Right. So giving like the choice to redo the level or the choice to move on is actually going to be one of the reasons why they trust the game more than the teacher, right? The teacher's just this security guard forcing them to sit in their seat, right? Yeah. The game is giving them autonomy to teach themselves in a way. That makes that's sense. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, and, and I, don't, I, I don't mind this being like a round table kind of conversation piece in here. You know, going against what Wes uh, ranted about yesterday, being prepared. These guys are prepared or not. <laughs> what you got next? Okay, well, this kind of goes to the, back to the losing part. Uh, so in a serious game, you learn as you play, right? Uh, and there's different things along the way where you have a worked out example. Then it's kind of, you know, instructional theory and a trial. And then there's a with typically follow up at the end. Um, and our theory has always been people learn better when they fail because they see what they did wrong and they have to do again. And it turns out that's not true. Uh, it's only true for some people. Some people have what's called the mastery response. It's they want mastery and they believe in themselves and they're going to get it. So they'll go back and those are the people that we make games for because those are the people who buy games. But in a school, you got to address the people who don't buy games. Otherwise, you're really screwing up the people who need you the most, right? Because those other guys are going to learn everything in life because they, they're strong that way, and guys and women. Um, so you can't abandon the people who uh, achieve learned helplessness. Where learned helplessness is, uh, gee, I, I don't remember your name, Barry. Uh, I don't remember your name. But I'm not good at names, so you know. I, or, you know, I, I take a, a test in math, and I did sh bad, so I'm not good at math. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. uh, study fashion design because I'm not good at math. Um, an entity versus an incremental view. Um, entity is you believe that your ability is fixed, mm -hmm. and, and uh, incremental is you believe that you can learn okay. by practice or through other means. But. What you said right there is the same thing that we would say. We would say, okay, these people have uh, learned helplessness, and the difference is the person. Those people are winners, they're or not even even winners, they're just strivers, the learners. They're gamers, they're they're you know, type A, what do you want to call it? I'm sorry, the incremental Incremental and entity. Okay, so incremental is the person who believes they can grow. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Did you have something um, you wanted to pipe in? I'm, I'm a high school teacher. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You're welcome here. And uh, thank you for your services, sir. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I see all that you're addressing. That I even tell my students at the beginning of each year, 
that those that make a straight A's aren't ever actually learning anything in class. The ones that are actually learning things are the ones that are making the lower grades. Because you learn by making mistakes. If you're always right, you're just confirming what you already know. And you're not going anywhere. You have to yeah. make <laughs> mistakes to actually increase your knowledge. Yes. And I, I, that's not quite true. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Joe, he's about to burst. To learn something and still get the, the answers right because I did my homework doesn't mean I failed. Well, James Comey, when he was... Um, uh, he was like the head of um, the um, FBI in New York, and he, you know, the prosecutors, the state's attorney, I guess it was, um, and he called in all the, the district attorneys and had them say, okay, who here has never lost the case? Uh, and some guys were really proud, and they stood up and said, you know, we have, and he called them something foul. I can't remember what he called them. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> chicken shit club. <laughs> you guys are members of the chicken shit club. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Because you never took a case and you, it was tough. And, uh, yeah. yeah there was a book out called wow. Chicken Shit Club, but I haven't read the book. So we roughly have about 10 minutes left. So, uh, I mean. Oh, oh, can I just get to the Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, whoops. Oh, okay. It ain't them. It can't be them. You can't say half the people aren't good enough to play my game and learn from it. That's against the rules. You have to make that trial different. And there are a lot of ways that you can do to create something called fail, uh, constructive failure. And, where the, and you know, there are things there, and I won't go into them all because it's long, but um, the biggest among them is to create a sense of learning rather than a sense of judgment. You know, so if you're doing a score, that's great for the people who go to high school, but who cares about them? The people who are really trying to reach are going to get turned off by that score, by the fact that they feel someone's watching and judging them. You have to make them feel that they're learning from this to go play again. And good games do that, so they're bigger audiences because of that. Um, so that's my win of the reason. Talk about some of your educational games that you have made. Like uh, one for that I'm a fan of is Brush Up. Did, did you bring any images of it? Have you guys yeah. heard of this, Brush Up? You even I even got the dances. Uh, you went VR with that too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. It's it's it because we had all the content. We turned it into a VR game, which teaches less, but it's way more fun. Yeah. Because you don't actually brush your teeth. Uh, <laughs> Somebody else scared by this game. Yeah. Said, said started referring to the monster, and I guess apparently it's the it's the reflection that has all the plaque. Oh yeah, and so an adult. It's not a child. She she said she was scared because. Of the tooth? Because we went and researched with children whether they'd like to get stars or ducks or little teeth or, or suns or what kind of things they wanted. And we accidentally showed them pictures that were made with like some sort of bad copy machine that had little specks of dirt on the teeth. And they went, ugh. They cared. The thing that really motivated them is to get those little specks of dirt off the teeth. Which is <laughs> But that's the mechanic being the message. Yep. I'm going to use that, I think. Go for uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> I stole it from uh, Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. The medium is the message. Yeah. Or but, massage. Oh, so you made this up. That's great. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you did it. It's, a, it's an evolution of someone else's idea. Yeah, yeah. that's very cool. The television is a vast wasteland. So as, the internet yet. so as game developers and game designers, uh, we have a role, you know, if we're, if we're focusing on educating through games, we have a very important role of finding that medium and that balance of how do we keep them immersed in our games without, you know, and, and mm. teaching them something at the same time, you know, the, the, the entertainment factor, right? You know, how, how did you go about uh, tackling that huge obstacle? You know, I used comedy in Egg Defender. Funny music, funny character, retro-looking characters, except, you know, and gameplay. Uh, and the, I mean, music is one of the key points in there because I mean, when you go to the quiz, it changes to an elevator music style game. You know, it's still the same. <laughs> it's still, I mean, it's all like techno now and, and intense. Um, but when you switch over to the quiz part, it goes into this like, uh, uh, um, oh god, a bossa. You know, <laughs> it switches to like an elevator music bossa. So you know, music and, and art is one of the ways that I try to keep the player immersed. 
So uh, uh, talk about either uh, Stephen, like with Nervitz or, or e either I mean, one. So all of the tools of making an entertainment game are still at your disposal here. Uh, you have, when you're making an educational game, you have more constraints because you have a learning objective that you're trying to teach. Um, but, you know, all of the same things that you would want to do to make a fun entertainment game, you can still apply. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm curious, how, how, do you, how do you tackle that huge obstacle? So. I, I would, though, say that fun is not a goal. And fun is often a very big distraction from the goal. And I say that coming from the entertainment industry and b before education games and caring intensely about making my games fun, I have fucked up very often because of that. I have people who say, I, okay, you go to the military, so well, this is going to, it's going to engage, you don't say fun, you say engage. I'm going to engage your, your learners. And they said, we're going to order them to play. Oh. I've had a customer say, we're going to, we're going to um, uh, sentence them to play your game. The traffic offenders are going to learn to play, and we don't. Doesn't have to be fun. It, that's not punishment, but but it doesn't have to be fun. And you can say, well, okay. So and I do say, okay. Well, the fun's free. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> you know the fun is just so that we enjoy our jobs and don't kill ourselves. Um, but I've lost jobs because. They're fun. Uh, specifically, we had a game that was meant to teach intelligence agents, uh, analysts, how to make good decisions. And it was competitive. It was very competitive at the beginning, but even once you're in, we were against this other um, uh, studio in uh, Albany, New York. And they were the anti fun. And we, the, the intelligence community has a lot of money. Um, so we wanted to make a game that required a lot of money to make because we could make a really fun game. And we did. It had great music and great... And we hired Hollywood screenwriters to come and stay in Atlanta for months writing funny jokes and getting great actors to say them and, and, and making it long as hours of play, but enjoyable, fun play. And she did the exact opposite. First of all, as you do it, you were, you were able to, you were required to run little experiments. I'm going to test A, B on some variable. And we tested on various, I don't even remember what we tested on right now. But I know what she tested on. She tested on fun. She said, suppose I take all the color of the game. Will you learn just as much if the game is just black and white? And turns out, yeah, you would. So she said, okay, so the game's not going to have color. Uh, how about avatars. If we make a very cool avatar that looks just like you, and you can choose from all these different avatars, are you going to learn more if the avatar looks like you and, and is good looking, or if this, you have this crappy icon? Turns out, you learn just as much with the crappy icon. <laughs> and, okay, so at the end of this process, and there is a lot riding on this process, a huge amount. And our game was fun. Our game, I watched, they tested this game in a, in a top secret installation. And I wasn't allowed to be in the room, so they put me in some other room. But the room they put me in, accidentally, was the room that spied on the room they were in. And had cameras, and I could operate those cameras, because no, they just left us there. Um, and I watched my boss, not my boss, my client, play our game. And she played every possibility, which took hours and hours, every joke. She mined out of the game, every you know um, dramatic situation. <laughs> But, yeah, we've only got a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not going to cut you off. Okay, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Go ahead. In the end, the fun game versus the game, and, and I played their game. Their game is really boring. You play, you're in a assembly line playing a robot that's a worker robot making choices, A, B choices all the time. It's un almost unplayable unless you're getting paid, but the subjects, they get paid, and so are the users. And we both thought about as well, but they could teach in 40 minutes what we, what our game, which took four hours, took the, taught the same thing. Right. Hmm. So yeah. we lost a wow. contract, and we lost out of, out of five or seven people. They're they're um, they're educational tools. Like you could just give someone a book instead of a game or software mm -hmm. or whatever, and they could learn the same things. But it's a different kind of tool. Some people have different learning styles. Uh, I'd be interested in the stickiness, like two years later, proving that the group that did the 
They did an eight, eight retention thing. They, they did an eight week retention, and uh, ours was a little better, uh, but yeah. when but they looked at how much time it took. To right. Play. They were they were and mostly concerned with cost effectiveness, probably. They were in that case. How much money? Yeah. Well, it wasn't one of the. It was an actual criterion that was added after we designed our game, unfortunately. But but there's lots of other cases where the game is just too fun because and it distracted you when you're making the game from teaching? Even um, even when you're trying to make a fun game. I've had testing in school students that they do hit a wall, they get frustrated and they just like put their head on their desk and they stop playing. Yep. Or, you know, whatever. It's you can't guarantee that the tool you make is gonna work for everybody. That right. too. Right, right, right. So well, I guess yeah, with only a few seconds left. Uh, any other last questions, comments? Yes? Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick about this because it's complicated, but uh, you you want to partner with somebody that has experience writing grants. So, for example, my boss uh, is a professor from UGA who has written grants before, and uh, he, he's a researcher. He knows kind of what they're looking for and, and how what they want in the research, and we also partner with an educational researcher that, that knows that part of like what they're looking for in terms of proving that students learn. Um, so it's complicated and if you if you want to apply for a grant I would definitely recommend finding someone to partner with that knows how to do that. I've, I've looked into getting grants. My wife is a grant writer. I'm not touching grants. <laughs> I learned you know, that that is not a category that I'm really seeking to go down. Yeah, yeah, let's make a game on how to write grants. <laughs> It'll be fun. Oh, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. yeah. For I, don't, yeah. I don't know, yes. having, having been through the process, having seen what these grants look like, if I could do it now and be successful, I could, it would probably, also here's another thing, if I tried, it would probably take me three or four years to get mm -hmm. it right, because you can submit a grant, and they will reject it, and you can get a little bit of feedback, and then you can try again, um, but it takes a long time. Yeah. Even if they like your grant, it might take a few years for it to get funded. Absolutely. Right. Our truth question game took four years of every year submitting it, getting rejected on particular points, writing up, okay, here we would solve those points. Now, usually it's the same people, and they say, okay, here's another level of problems we have with your thing. Uh, and now go hire more experts in these fields and solve these problems. And it took four years. It really made the game a lot better. Uh, but it took four years. Yeah. Yeah, if you want a grant, hire a grant writer <laughs> or learn how to do it yourself. So, Stephen, ah, thank you so much, guys, and thank you for the panel. Thanks for coming. <laughs>